Welcome. Um, my name's Silas. I'm a second year medic. I uh, just wanted to welcome you to this lunch bar. Thanks for coming. I hope you've managed to grab uh, a baguette and a drink. If not, go get one or get one at the end or whatever. Um, just going to quickly run through how this event's going to pan out. So first of all, uh, in a minute, I'll invite Niv up to speak to us. Um, he'll speak to us for about 15, 20 minutes or so. Uh, and then after that, there'll be time uh, to answer some of your questions you might have. Um, so if you do have questions, it'd be really great if you could text in to a number that will be on the screen during the talk um, so that we can answer the questions afterwards. Um, that'd be really cool. Uh, just quickly, there are toilets back out that door that you came through. Um, other than that, I don't think there's much more to say. In fact, Nip, welcome. Um, who are you and why are you here? Great. Uh, my name is Niv. I live in Southampton where I work with university students, uh, actually helping with the Christian Union there. Uh, why am I here? Well, to give this talk, um, to speak to all of you. And it's a real privilege to be here. Thank you for welcoming me to Bristol, which I think is a very cool city. And I don't feel like I'm cool enough really to belong here. So it's nice that you tolerate me for a little bit. Great. Brilliant. Well, um, <laughs> Goodness, this lunchtime we are thinking about a topic that is so serious, so weighty. I've got up there, if you can see it, a picture of a very famous sculpture. It's by Auguste Rodin and it's called The Thinker. Perhaps you've seen it, but maybe something that's news to you, like it was to me, is that The Thinker is thinking about hell. This sculpture was commissioned uh, and Rodin had to make it as a frontispiece for a scene from Dante's Inferno. The Thinker is thinking about hell. And that's what we're doing this lunchtime. Our title is Callous. How can a good God send people to hell? I often get asked that question when, when people know I'm a Christian. They say, so do you, do you think I'm going to hell? And it seems so incongruous to us. The idea of a God who is good and then him sending people to hell, a place of eternal punishment. And maybe even uglier than the idea is the attitude with which some religious people talk about it. You think of Westboro Baptist Church with their hateful and inflammatory picketing of funerals. You think of the way some people use hell as a coercion, as a threat. Join us or suffer forever. Well, what we're thinking about today is extremely weighty. This question about hell requires a serious response and it's not something any of us can be academic about. I want to be up front and say that I can't talk about these things with clinical detachment. As I speak, I'm thinking about loved ones I've lost, members of my family, many, many close friends. I'm also speaking about deep, profound, eternal things. I don't claim to have lots of answers. There are lots of things that aren't my place to say, so I don't dare say that. But I am happy to be here because I believe that as we think about this topic, we'll actually get close to the thing that makes the Christian faith beautiful. We'll even get to see a depth of love we may not have imagined before. Now, it may surprise you to know that the person in the Bible who talks about hell the most is Jesus. The most loving person you meet in its pages talks about it the most. And he often does so in the context of stories. I want to read you one of those stories. It'll come up on the screen, but do listen. Jesus says... There was a rich man who dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gates was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me, and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, because I'm in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he's comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them, so they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. 
Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said. But if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. What I've just read is a really sobering story. Why would Jesus tell a story like that? I think the answer is as a warning. Let me quote the atheist magician, Penn Gillette, and he's talking about people who proselytize, proselytize, however you pronounce it, persuade people of their position. He says this, I've always said that I don't respect people who don't proselytize. I don't respect that at all. If you believe that there's a heaven and a hell and people could be going to hell or not getting eternal life, how much do you have to hate somebody to not proselytize? How much do you have to hate somebody to believe everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? I think he's right. It's loving to warn people of danger. I don't want to threaten anyone today. I don't want to coerce anyone today. But if you think that people are in danger, how much do you have to hate them not to tell them about it? Jesus speaking about hell is a, is a mark of his love. It's the love that wants to warn us of the danger that's there. Maybe we listen and we kind of think, well, why should there be danger at all? Isn't God meant to be good? But the surprising answer is, there is danger because God is good. I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but if God is good, then he must deal with the evil that happens in our world. To take an example that's all over the news, what would be a good God's attitude to the so-called Islamic State. He could look at it and approve of those atrocities, but then he wouldn't be good. He'd be evil. He could be totally apathetic, but then again, he wouldn't be good. He'd be evil. The God who casually shrugs at Auschwitz, sees no difference between Mother Teresa and Jimmy Savile, is a God who's thoroughly evil. Now, a good God must make sure that justice is upheld, and nothing could be less good Nothing could be more callous than failing to bring justice. Let me quote the Holocaust survivor and author Elie Wiesel, who often said this, the opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. This rich man was happy to live while a sick man starved to death at his gate. What kind of God would be indifferent to that? Our world is full of acts of atrocity and injustice and exploitation. What kind of God would be indifferent to that? If God is good, then he must comfort the hurting. And he must punish the evildoer. And that's what you find all over the Bible. There's not a a hint of indifference about this God. He's passionate about justice in his world. And according to Jesus, it matters how I treat you. And it matters how you treat me. I don't know if you ever got into the band Red Hot Chili Peppers, but in their song Can't Stop, which is full of lyrics I don't understand, they finish with one I do. They say, this life is more than just a read-through. And the Bible agrees. All over it, you find a God passionately concerned with justice, telling us that the lives we lead are more than just a read-through, and that we matter. By the way, can you see that we want this? We want evil to be taken seriously. And God's claim that he will judge evil actually brings hope. Hope that what's gone wrong and what's been done wrong can be put right. And maybe even better than that, the fact that we are taken seriously. That figure we read about, Lazarus, is a very interesting figure. In all of the many stories Jesus tells, Lazarus is the only one who gets a name. It's a very precious detail. That rich man had luxury, had banquets, had servants. But Lazarus had a name. And the name means, I don't know if you know, God is my help. Can you imagine in the story, all of the people who walked past Lazarus and did nothing, all of the people who didn't care, can you imagine how callous they were? But God saw and God cared. He saw how Lazarus, a person he made, was being treated, and he wasn't indifferent, and he took it seriously. Ask God not to care about evil, and you're asking him not to care at all. Take justice and a final judgment and hell out of the picture, 
And it's hard to say how God is good in any meaningful sense of the word. A good God must punish evil. But maybe we think, okay, but why hell? And I'm not sure what pops into your imagination when you think about hell. Perhaps you've got those lurid medieval depictions of hell, demons, pitchforks, agony. Looks like the work of a cosmic sadist. Maybe you hear Jesus talking about fire and you have already painted the fresco in your imagination. Well, it's not actually that simple. You see, Jesus often describes the destiny of human beings apart from God's. And this is one story among many. And those stories are full of pictures. For example, this one had fire, which is a common Bible picture for burning, cleansing, purity, judgment. But in other stories, Jesus talks about outer darkness, a picture of being excluded and alone. Now, you don't need me to tell you, you can't have fire and darkness at the same time. These are pictures. But they are pictures of something. What are they pictures of? Well, they're describing something key about hell. According to Jesus, hell is a relationship status that we choose, an eternity apart from God. The thing that makes hell, hell, is that it's an eternity apart from God's love and joy and goodness, cut off from every good thing because every good thing comes from him. An eternity of rejecting him and being rejected by him. Cut God out of the picture and because he's good, because he's just, he will honour the decision you've made. That's what all of these pictures Jesus paints have in common. Hell is a relationship status, eternity apart from God's that we choose. And this rich man is a, it's a really sobering picture of that. Just think about how he behaved. He was in torment, but he never asked to leave. He was being punished for living his life and treating Lazarus as a nobody. But did you notice that he's doing the same thing? He's not even talking to Lazarus. He's saying, Abraham, send Lazarus here, send Lazarus there, still treating him like a nobody. The one thing you're not seeing in him is repentance, even though he thinks his brothers should repent. There's no reaching out to God from this man. Hell is that relationship status that we choose. I find myself thinking of C.S. Lewis's words in The Great Divorce. He says this, There are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, Thy will be done. Or those to whom, in the end, God says, Thy will be done. No human being has ever just been ornamental to God. Instead, made in his image, what we do and who we are matter to him. And he made us to love him and be loved by him, but he made us for real love, not automaton, puppet love that's forced. And so we've always had that freedom to reject him. If we didn't, it wouldn't have been real love. So take hell out of the picture, and what are you asking God to do? To obliterate our choices. Not only would that violate his justice, it would violate us and what we've stood for. Hell is God taking our rejection of him seriously. And what makes hell, hell is that he won't be there. We cut ourselves off from an eternal being, and that's what makes it eternal. God is the one who's described as light and life and the bringer of joy, and that's what makes hell a place of darkness and exclusion and sorrow. Because God and his goodness is not there. Often people ask me, will I really go to hell for doing that one little thing? It seems comically over the top. But hell isn't about that one little thing being punished. It's about what the whole of our lives have said to God. I don't want you. And God's saying, finally, then have it your way. I I used to think that hell was really unfair. I've learned at least two things since. Firstly, Fair is all it is. The Bible is adamant again and again that God judges people according to what they've done. He's not going to fly off the handle. The philosopher Bertrand Russell was once asked, what would you say to God if you met him after death? Russell was an atheist. And he said, I'd say to God this, not enough evidence, God, not enough evidence. Now that is a debatable point, highly debatable, but also it isn't the point. The Bible says again and again that we stand before God to be judged for the things we've done. 
Not how much evidence we figured out, not how correct our theology was, but the basis of what we've done. We will get a fair hearing. But the second thing I've been seeing is that fair is a dangerous thing to ask for. God will be fair to our world. But what if he's fair to me? What if he's fair to us? Would we really meet those standards? Well, let me, let me put it this way. Do we even meet our own standards? I've never met anyone who tells me that they've always done what they knew was right, that they've never done things they knew were wrong. We have moments where if someone else had done the thing I just did, I'd condemn them outright. And we have moments where the good things I've done, if I'm honest, have come out of a place of selfish, dark motivation. And if I fall short of my standards, then how could I reach God's? I think we often miss this because we enjoy comparing ourselves to others. But what if that's missing the point? Everyone feels moral when they compare themselves to Hitler. And it's always Hitler, isn't it? But if God's worth knowing, his standard will be higher than not Hitler. His standard will be justice, will be goodness, will be all the things we wish the world was when we see evil and and injustice. We want justice and God will be fair. But if we ask God to be fair, then he'll be fair to us and and that's a danger. Last year, after those awful Charlie Hebdo attacks, um, Will Self wrote this in The Guardian. I just want to quote it. Talking about the terrorists, he says this. What we can unequivocally assert is that these men in those rattling, coughing, cordite, stinking moments were evil. If by evil is understood this, an egotism that grew like a cancer, a lust for status and power and significance which metastasized through these murderers' brains. The problem for the staunch defenders of Western values is that each and every one of us possesses this capacity for evil. It's implicit in having an ego at all. So when the demonstrators stood in the Place de la République holding placards that read, Je suis Charlie, they might just as well have held one's reading, Nous sommes les terroristes. It is shocking, but I don't just think he aims to shock. I think he's getting to something true. That capacity for evil is implicit in us all. And if God is fair, where does that leave us? Well, the real question doesn't become how can a good God send people to hell? It becomes how can a good God do anything else for people who reject him, for people who fall short of the standard and know it, for people who routinely hurt one another and ruin the world around them. How can a good God do anything else? But the amazing thing that Jesus said again and again, even more than he spoke about hell, was that God has done something else, something remarkable, and that hell isn't God's last word to people who've fallen short. It's God's love that takes him to uphold justice and care about this world. But it also leads him to do something else. Finally, Jesus says this to every person alive. He says, you can go to hell over my dead body. Over my dead body. Again and again, Jesus described his purpose in life as dealing with our dilemma, making sure that we don't have to face this judgment by taking it on himself and by dying for us. The same love of God that leads him to judge evil also led him to this beautiful and undeserved act of self-sacrifice. At the end of Jesus' life, he died a brutal death of crucifixion, and yet the physical pain was, was the tip of the iceberg. The real horror Jesus faced was spiritual, relational. Some of his last words include this anguished cry. You can read it in some of the accounts. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What's happening as Jesus dies? He's going through hell. What is hell? It's God's rejection of us in response to our rejection of him. And as Jesus dies, he faces that rejection. He cries out to God, and there's silence. He's in the outer darkness forsaken. He's in the flames of a punishment he doesn't deserve. Because all through his life, you find an attitude that never rejected God, that never fell short. So why is he there? The answer is love. Love that cares so deeply, 
so extravagantly about us that even though nothing we've done could earn it, Jesus wants to take your place. Jesus wants to take the punishment that we deserve. He wants to bear the weight of it for you. And he chooses to go and face hell so that no one ever has to. And because he offers up a perfect, spotless, eternal life up to death, Jesus makes forgiveness a real possibility for us. His final words were a triumphant cry, it is finished. That punishment taken, that price paid, that debt cleared. And so Jesus says to everyone in this room today, you can go to hell over my dead body. I faced it so you don't have to. I went there for you. Will you? Will you accept that offer of love that I have to give? Do you understand why the last thing I can call that good is callous? Why Christians call the day Jesus died Good Friday? Because of that, we can become like Lazarus. Remember, his name means God is my help. The same God who has every right to judge us comes in Jesus to bear my shame away, to take the punishment that I I should have had and to give me forgiveness and to say, you can go to hell, but only over my dead body. I would do everything to stop you. That's a reality for everyone who trusts in Jesus, and, and it could be a reality for you today. Thank you so much for listening to me through what must have been a really difficult talk to hear. It was a very difficult talk to give. Thank you so much for listening. But just before we go to a time of questions, I want to say two things. If what Jesus says is true, then two very loving things are being offered to us today by him. A loving warning. But secondly, and better than that, a loving rescue extended across history with nail-scarred hands saying, will you receive this forgiveness from me? And if you want that for yourself, you can have it. And you don't have to do anything to earn it. You just need to offer up your empty hands to receive it from him. And I want to give us a chance to do that. If you don't want to do that yet, um, then do listen, because the prayer I'm about to pray, talking to Jesus, is the way people do accept this. I want to pray for us and show you that it's really as easy as saying sorry, thank you, and and please to God. Um, I'm just going to say that prayer now. Nothing funny is going to happen with the lights. Uh, I won't do anything interesting with my voice. Um, And if you want to close your eyes, you can. I'll keep mine open. Um, But this is the kind of prayer you would pray to enjoy what Jesus has to give. Lord God, I want to say sorry that I haven't lived in the way I know I should and that I've fallen short again and again. Thank you that you want to forgive me, that you want to be more than fair to me. Thank you that Jesus came to take that away from me. Please, may I have that for myself. May I begin this new life of a relationship with you that lasts forever. Amen. That's the kind of prayer you can pray. If that's a prayer you have prayed, you've got these little forms on your um, chairs, do tick that box, count me in, um, and we'd love to talk to you about that. In fact, if everyone wants to grab that, just before question time, we've got an opportunity for you to give some feedback. The feedback can be anything you like. It can be comments about my jumper. I'm very proud of it. I think it's a good one. It can be comments about the talk you heard. Um, Do do fill that in, um, and also feel free to put your name and your your phone number. Uh, We'd love to find out more about how we can do these lunches better here at Bristol. Um, I also want to explain the other two boxes. We have one which says, tell me more please. So if your interest has peaked, anything you want to hear about makes you want to know more, do tick that one. And another box called Christianity Explored. Can I invite Tiffany up to explain a bit more about that? Um, Great. So Christianity Explored is basically an opportunity as a group to gather over a discussion You can ask your questions, and we're going to look at the claims of Jesus together um, through looking at the book of Mark, which is one of the books in the Bible. Um, And, uh, yeah, it's really chilled. Our first session, if you, like, draw your attention to this flyer, is on Sunday, and we're going to meet just across the road um, in Multifaith Chaplaincy and have brunch together. So I'd love to see you there. Uh, thanks, Nave. Um, we're going to do the questions now. Uh, we will make sure we finish 
at 10 to, um, so there will be time for you to get away and get your lectures, but if you do need to go, just slip out. Okay, so first question. Uh, why does Jesus need to take the punishment for me? I'm not that bad. Can God not let me go to heaven for living on balance a good life? Uh, that is a very good question. I think a lot of people do think that. Ha haven't, you know, I, I haven't done, I'm not Hitler, you know, I haven't done that. Um, there are a couple of questions about that. Um, basically, in answer, I want to say yes, except what does it mean to say, on balance, I've lived a good life? What if God's standards really are high? What if he's so loving and concerned about you that he doesn't just care about the surface of your life, but also beneath the surface, your intentions and your motivations? What if he judges us on that basis too? I guess my question is, do you really think, before a God like that, that you, that you have been so good? And secondly, what about the people that we've hurt? What about the damage that we've done? It is a good question, I understand that. And, and yet I think the more I look at Jesus, the more I see that he's come to deal with something in me that I recognize. Uh, motives that fall short, people that I've hurt, um, and a growing awareness that I need help. Next question. Cool, next question. Um, can I get someone I love out of hell? If they spoke against Jesus and by the teachings of the church are now there, is there any way I can get them out? That, that is a hard question, and I, I feel it because, well, I'll talk about this bit tomorrow during our suffering talk, but at university in my third year, a good friend of mine um, died in a car crash. She and I were actually reading John's Gospel together, and I have no idea what she made of Jesus. Um, I didn't want to pressure her to do anything, and I think that's the right thing, but she died in a car crash, and I have no idea what she'd done with respect to God's offer of forgiveness. So if that's your question, can I say I've, I've wept over it? Um, huh. What I've been learning is that that is between them and God. And I, I don't, in a funny way, I, I don't need to worry about it anymore. There's this verse from the Bible that I've been coming back to again and again. Abraham speaking to God, he says to God, and this is his bargaining chip, he says to God, will not the judge of all the earth do what is right? Look, I don't know so many things about this. I have so little to offer you in terms of answers, but this I do know. The judge of the earth will do what is right. And I also know what that judge is like. I look at Jesus and I see the way that he, he was perfect in his discernment. He never put a foot wrong. When people tried to test him, when people pointed at the, the sort of scummy outcast, look at her, judge her, look at him, he's scum. Jesus was always perfect in how he approached those situations. I know enough to trust him. I, I realise how unsatisfying that is to hear. Um, and believe me that it's taking me years to get, to get to understand this deeper. But that's the best I've got to give for now. Yeah, thanks, Neil. Um, Rob Bell, a Christian preacher, states, hell is a rubbish fire outside Jerusalem and is therefore figurative. What evidence do you have for hell being a real, real place? Great. And actually that word Gehenna is a... Um, rubbish dump outside of Jerusalem. Actually, figurative language is, is very much part of the course. As I told you, Jesus mainly talks about this through stories. But, and take it from someone who studied English at university, to say that something is figurative does not automatically mean that nothing about that is real. The fact that there are figurative elements to it, the fact that these are pictures, doesn't mean, therefore, it doesn't exist. If anything, I think that's a, it's quite an unwarranted conclusion. As I tried to say, these are pictures. But they're pictures of something. And I think if you read through Jesus' teachings and his words, you, you want to ask yourself, if there's nothing in this, why does he keep putting these pictures out there? What's he trying to do? Uh, more than that, you could use that same language to talk about paradise. Paradise just means garden. Did you know that? Uh, so I suppose if you talk to a Christian, they'd say they really believe that they, they will be with God, enjoying his fatherly care forever. And we're very happy to take that figurative language and see the, the reality behind it. I'd encourage us to do the same thing with what Jesus says here. I think that's being a fair reader. Uh, you say that evil people such as ISIS members must go to hell. Uh, are people who don't believe also as evil is not believing actively evil? Mm, good question. Huh. So... I wouldn't say that people who are part of ISIS and people who don't believe are on the same level of evil. I wouldn't say that. I, I don't think that's clear. Jesus once talks about you know, people being judged um, 
differently because of, because of the, the things they've done. Um, and so I wouldn't say that at all. However, I, I wonder if the questioners quite heard the thing I was trying to say. Hell is not primarily uh, a ticking off because you did this wrong or that right. It is a relationship status. Not believing is saying to God that you don't want him. Not believing is saying to this God who wants to relate to you, but I don't want to relate to you. Um, therefore, that, that's what this discussion is about. It, it's not that not believing is such a terrible thing, the same way that genocide is, but, but what it is is a relational thing, a saying no to God. A saying no that because God cares about us, he honours now, the good news is he doesn't honour it straight away. He doesn't rush to judge us. The Bible says very preciously he's slow to anger. But he does honour it in the end. Um, I suppose I'd want to ask back, what are we actually asking from God? If we say we don't want him, don't want to live his way, um, but then object to the place where he says, okay, don't have me. Don't have my way. Thanks. Um, just one here about... God's nature is loving God. So why would a loving God create people he knows will reject him mm. and then as a constant consequence of rejecting him suffer yeah, for yeah, him? Yeah, sure, sure. And I think you just have, you know, I I'm not that smart. But even if I were incredibly smart, obviously this would be the point where I have to say, I don't know. I can't tell you the mind of God. What I try to allude to in my talk, and again I'll say a bit more about this tomorrow, is that what God made us for was real love. And if you've ever loved anyone, romantically, in a family way, you'll know that involves risk. When you love someone and you open yourself up to them, you make yourself vulnerable. You open the possibility for them to reject you. Say I really like this girl and I want her to go out with me. What am I really going to do? Am I going to go and try to compel her love? Am I going to you know, hold a gun to her head and say, do you want to go to Nando's? <laughs> my ideal date location. <laughs> you know, if she said yes, I wouldn't be able to WhatsApp everyone and be like, great, great news, guys. <laughs> guess, guess who's really good with girls? <laughs> no. Real love involves that risk. In me saying, do you want to go to Nando's? And her saying, not in a million years. Isn't that right? Now, for God to make a universe out of that real love, and with that real love as a thing he wants in his creation, that risk was always there. Why allow it? I, I can't tell you the mind of God, but I know that it's his delight to make uh, that kind of world. And I know it's his delight not to take our first answer, but to chase after us in his love, um, to run after us in Jesus and say, come back, come back. Okay, just a couple more questions. Um, if hell is a place where we are not in a relationship with God, how do we know hell is a bad place? Because God is good and a fountain of all good. One of the, the letters in the New Testament Paul writes is to the Romans where he says, don't you realise that the, the good things from God are tokens of his kindness meant to lead you to repentance? If you walk through this world and you enjoy uh, a snapshot of some music from a cafe that you really love and you, you have a bite of a baguette and it's just delicious and the sun is shining, please don't think that's an accident. God has filled this world with good things, paved your way with those blessings because he longs to say to you, come to me. Look what a God I am. If you like music, just wait till you hear the true creativity that I have to show. Do you see the point? Um, to have eternity apart from that God is for the music to end. It's for the food to lose its flavour. It's for the light to turn to darkness. And, and, and yeah, to, to have no more gifts because we have no more giver. That's why it would be so bad. That's why, by the way, I'm standing here answering your very hard questions because I just don't want you to go there. Okay, last question. Uh, thanks for these questions, by the way. They've been great. Would a good person who doesn't believe in God go to heaven or hell? What if they never had access to a Bible? Oh, yeah, okay. Well, there are two very big questions there. I'll deal with them in order. Would a good person... Well, so here's the thing. Can you be good uh, while living in a world made by God who paves your way with good things, who's made himself very clear? We'll come to the second question in a bit and still say no to him. That ingratitude, that ignorance, it's a willful thing. So I'm not sure the definition of good could include um, someone who, who's rejecting God. Um, secondly, what about people who, who don't have a Bible? What about people who've never heard? That, that is a huge question. Oh boy, again, so many things I don't get to say, so many things I don't know. 
I want to speak cautiously and humbly. But I do want to say this. Firstly, like I said, God judges people on what they know. He judges people according to the standard they've lived up to. You don't have to worry that he'll fly off the handle. It's not like where you walk in somewhere and they're like, what's the password? And you're like, password? My sisters always did this to me. They ganged up. You know, I try to get into my room. What's the password? I, I don't know. It won't be like that. <laughs> God is a fair judge. He judges us according to what we do know. Secondly, God is a God who loves for people to hear about this. Why do you think there's a Christian union at your university? Why aren't the Christians just gathering together, singing fun songs to each other and patting each other on the back and wearing sandals? <laughs> it's because they are slowly becoming a bit more like the God they worship. They want all of you to find the joy that is so much more than sandals and back patting. Um, and that's why you even find Christians travelling land and sea to share this news. They don't want anyone to be in that position. And thirdly, we're not them. What if people have never heard? Well, quite right. What a question. We can think more. Grab me afterwards. But we are not that. And I was not that when I started investigating these things. It's just because of what you've heard, neither are you. Um, so please do be thinking about these things. Please um, do. And thank you for listening to me.